Hello? Love Talk Radio. Welcome to Women Who Rock With Success, a digital media for entrepreneurial women. Women are profiled on our digital platforms for branding and networking opportunities. To advertise on one of our shows, just go to our website at www.womenwhorockwithsuccess.com and submit a request on our advertising page. Did you know that we also report stories with top-notch media communications? Editors and reporters can submit credible and validated stories to our media source. Just go to <coughs> www.topnotchmedia.org to learn more. The conference will begin in a moment. Good morning and welcome to Women Who Rock Investigates. Uh, this is an extension brand from our Women Who Rock with Success show, and so we're going to get right into um, to morning this morning's show. So, of course, everyone is aware of the COVID-19 and how it has dwarfed uh, businesses, educational systems, as well as prison um uh, agencies or organizations. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is in regards to the massive release of prisoners. And so um, today, to help us to be able to understand the effects of that, which will um, eventually, you know, you know, impact our economy, our, our legal system, and our government system. So the experts that we have on the panel this morning is criminal defense attorney, um, Alan Friedman of the Alan Friedman um, of the Friedman Law Firm. I'm sorry, and a malpractice attorney um, K. Van Way of um, Way Presley and Williams uh, Law Law Firm, and she is also best known for um, the key attorney in Doctor Death uh, with um, the neurologist Chris, Christopher. I think his last name is Dutch or something like that. So, and our last guest on the panel today is Nora uh, Dale Meitner, and she is a professor at the Washington and Lee University and the editor and federal sentencing reporter. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the show on today. Good morning, Diane. Good morning. Good morning, Diane. Okay. Diane. Okay, great. So we're going to start with you, Alan. As always, this is about your fifth time on um, uh, the show, and thank you so much for always availing your service uh, to Women Who Rock With Success Investigates. And so share with us, you know, we, we, we continue to see a lot of release in regards to the pandemic, um, and uh, the prison, the prison systems are just just releasing them, just releasing them. We don't want them to get infected. And of course, um, this is going to be a question for uh, Kay um, after you as to the legalities that some prison systems may feel that um, they may incur due to um, the inmates getting um, affected. So, talk to us a little bit, um, um, Alan as to why you think that they are releasing so many prisoners and such a massive amount at one time. Well, uh, good morning. Um, I, I'm i very passionate about this cause. Uh, I'm glad that you bring this uh, question up. Um, interestingly, I was reviewing for the show yesterday, and the prisoner revolt um, and discontent with this um, issue is is worldwide um, and they're releasing prisoners all over, all over the world but unfortunately in the United States we have the world's largest prison population which really places us at a huge disadvantage when dealing with this COVID crisis uh, mm -hmm. for example I don't know if you're familiar with um, the Marion Correctional Institute in Ohio, right, where 80% okay. of the prison population have tested positive for the coronavirus, as well as 160 mm -hmm. of the corrections officers and employees. Um, um, out of 2,500 inmates, um, you know, 2,300 <laughs> have the COVID um, disease. Mm -hmm. It's it's a, it's a disaster. It's it's almost. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a genocide or a holocaust happening to these inmates. You know, as we know, um, uh, this uh, the prison is a, is a perfect 
environment for the transmission of COVID disease. A prisoner um, is powerless to do anything to help themselves. And um, it's a Petri dish. Um, as we saw when the, when the disease was first breaking out, the first places where the disease would transmit were on cruise ships and uh, nursing homes. So mm-hmm. now the, the, the prison is the new place for uh, COVID transmission. And since we have such a huge amount of a prison population, we have more prisoners locked down than China and Russia combined. We have uh, 20% of the world's prison population, which is a huge liability in battling this uh, COVID crisis. And, and we've done some lip service to releasing you know, a small number of the inmates who are locked down presently, but we haven't gone anywhere near as close. And I would just make a final observation on this point which is, you know, in the jurisdictions that have taken steps to release prisoners to house arrest, which is great, I think it's fantastic. We have to ask ourselves the question, seeing as we are prisoners, prison state to begin with, we have to ask ourselves the question, if we can suddenly release somebody to house arrest and have them being in their house with electronic monitoring, and if that's so safe, then that begs the question of why they were in prison in the first place. We would think that mm-hmm. a judge would be sentencing someone to prison unless it was absolutely necessary that they should be serving time in a prison. And a final thought, an observation on this point is uh, here in the state of Connecticut, the governor Lamont has resisted uh, calls to release prisoners. The ACLU filed a lawsuit that was rejected by a court to release prisoners, and we haven't had a lot of movement releasing prisoners because they say one of the things they say is there's no place for the prisoners to go. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, just a simple mathematic calculation, it costs $62,000 a year to house an uh, inmate here in Connecticut prison, which is more than it costs to go to some of the fine uh, colleges <laughs> in our nation. Mm-hmm. So I was just thinking that you know what, it would be a lot less expensive and more healthy to use some of these empty hotels we have to house some of the prisoners that maybe not may not have a place to go and put them in a much safer environment until the COVID crisis passes and save some money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I'm going to back up before I get to you, uh, Kay. So, Alan, if you would just briefly kind of describe to the panel and the audience in case if there are listeners and plus – Um, Also, um, there are new guests that's on the panel. So if you would um, share with the audience and the panel um, uh, just a little bit about you and your practice as to what you do. Well, uh, I've been battling for criminal justice for 28 years. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I fight for people's rights. I I defend the oppressed against, um, you know, what I see as an unjust system that's stacked against, um, you know, people. Very, it's a very unfortunate, you know, when you see situations, I don't know if, if, if your listeners are familiar with Michael Avenatti, the, the powerful, formerly powerful lawyer of Stormy Daniels, who mm-hmm. was convicted <laughs> for extorting Nike, right? And, and he, he, facing decades of time in jail, you know, of course, he had to be released from jail on a, a million dollar bond, and he's now in a, in a luxury uh, setting, while many minorities and people without access to power and influence are, are stuck in, in the Marion uh, Correctional Institute, unable to be released and suffering from COVID. Um, that's why I got into the criminal um, law as a, as a profession to help, uh, you know, correct some of these injustices uh, on a daily basis and, and work uh, uh, to, to see justice. It's, it's, uh, um, it's unfortunate in, in our day and age today in the United States that we have these uh, disparities and outcomes based upon your financial uh, setting and your racial setting. And it's interesting how the COVID crisis has uh, demonstrated that not only do um, you know, your economic housing and living arrangements are affected based upon your your social and economic situation but also your health and your and your, mm-hmm. and your um, expected outcome of how you're going to survive the covid crisis is also affected by these same 
factors, right? The same factors that will make a difference to whether or not you can afford a private a defense attorney to defend your case and get you a great outcome or whether you're stuck with a public defender are the same determinators who, who make a decision whether or not you're going to be stuck with a, um, you know, emergency room um, and, and no health care and you haven't had good health checkups and now you're in, in poor health and you're going to be on a bad outcome with COVID. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Oh, so I'm, a, I'm a crusader so, for, for fairness. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, Kay, good morning. And so um, share with the listeners um, a little bit about you. Uh, you were on our Women Who Rock With Success um, show previously, and uh, we have brought you on to the Women Who Rock With Success um, Investigates. And so share a little bit about you and what your practice does. Well, good morning, Diane, and I wanted to thank you for having me back on your show and giving me the opportunity to talk with other smart professionals and learn something from (laughs) others. Uh, It's wonderful. Well, I have practiced law for 30 some odd years. I am a personal injury trial lawyer with a special focus in medical malpractice. And I've come to find my passion at age, I'm gonna be 62 here in a few more weeks. And I've really found my passion, which is patient safety advocacy. And this is keeping me uh, so invigorated and wanting to, not dreading working 60 hour work weeks, but embracing the opportunity to work those hours and to help people. So that's what I do. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So with that being said, um, you know, we talked about on the Women Who Rock With Success segment <clears throat> that you were on before. So share with us a little bit about um, the COVID-19 and then the prisoners that are being released and the tort claims that you feel that is going to probably come after this. Um, because I know, you know, um, Alan had just touched on um um, in regards to the nursing homes and what have you, and then I think you had mentioned on the previous show that some things were going on way before the, the COVID-19 <laughs> in the nursing home, uh, you know, fields, which I do agree with it because, you know, um, cleaning is, uh just don't start just from overnight. It's a period of time. So share with us a little bit as to how you feel that court, tort, tort claims will evolve from all of this is that is going on. Family members have questions. They're not being answered. We're having updates about uh, uh, different uh, things on the COVID uh, from the uh, the president of the United States, but it's rarely mentioned in the updates in regards to the prisoners' releases. Yes. Well, it's so interesting. When Alan was speaking, I was taking notes, and <laughs> every time he said something about prisoners. I was drawing a line between that and nursing home residents. And just a few similarities would be that nursing home residents and those living in um, long-term mental health facilities and group homes and things of that nature, like prisoners, they have no choice of their residents. They're living in close quarters with others. Um, Mm -hmm. They... The the other similarity I noticed when Alan was speaking is he defends the oppressed against the powerful. And I think you can say that my practice is Mm -hmm. similar in that Mm -hmm. the patient in this setting, the patient's the little guy and the hospital corporations and nursing home corporations, the the entire healthcare industry, that's the big and the powerful. The other similarities is that there are disparities uh, based upon racial and socioeconomic divides. We find that um, in many situations, I'll take maternal mortality as an example, that there are huge disparities along race lines about uh, women who are dying um, during or shortly after childbirth. Um, As well with nursing homes, we have a situation right now in Dallas where you can pretty well draw the socioeconomic lines to show the nursing homes that have the highest outbreaks are those mm. that are in the impoverished communities. So anyway, mm-hmm. I just I, I wanted to draw those parallels. Um, 
and I, I don't want to drone on and on because I could I could talk so much about this legal landscape for patients and mm-hmm. workers, and there are mm-hmm. so many unknowns. There are workers who are being forced into work situations by employers who are valuing their own profits more than their employees' safety and that of their employees' family, and I'm actively pursuing those cases, as well as I'm about to file a lawsuit against a nursing home chain that has more than half of its residents infected with the COVID virus right now. So, uh, and, and in my inbox this, just this morning was a note about how people are already making moves. If I say people, politicians are already making moves Mm -hmm. to seize this opportunity to further limit patients' rights. And there's no doubt about it that, there are heroes that are emerging as a result of this COVID crisis. And we all know people on those front lines that are heroes that are risking their own lives to save the lives Mm -hmm. of others. But Mm -hmm. we're seeing with that, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And there's a very, very dark underbelly in medicine. But politicians, being who they are and doing what they do, they see an opportunity to sway the public's sentiments and say, oh, my goodness, these horrible trial lawyers are lawsuit happy, and we need to offer all of these legal protections for the healthcare industry and for businesses. And in my view, having been in the trenches for 30-some-odd years, the last thing Mm -hmm. in the world that we need is more protection for the powerful and less rights Mm -hmm. for the common man and woman. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well stated, uh, Kay, and thank you so much uh, for your response, because I think on the, the last several podcasts, uh, that's what um, Alan was uh, reiterating as to, um, I guess it's the the more of the the um the demographics you know who gets off you know is is it do i have enough money do i have i think it was the uh, the former illinois governor i think he was released i don't know if it was due to the pandemic or i'm not for sure if it was due to the president um signing a um a waiver to have him released, but um, this is not something where attorneys are not are getting like a free ticket they're standing up for um the individuals, their families, and so that is very, very important. So thank you so much for your response. Um, uh, good morning, Nora, and um, share a little bit um, about the the things that you do, the work that you do in your profession with the audience and with the panel guest. Uh, of course, Diane. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's my first time on your show, uh, and I'm okay. absolutely thrilled get to meet Alan and Kay um, in that way. And I think just like Kay said, I just took a lot of uh, notes because I just found uh, both of them uh, wonderful. So um, mm-hmm. I think I am animated um, very much like both of them by social justice um, concerns. So I'm a law professor. I also mm-hmm. served as a law school dean um, for about um, a decade. And one of the things that really have always mattered to me, first of all, is increasing um, the diversity of law students along racial and socioeconomic um, mm-hmm. lines and making them more than just good practitioners, also trying to get them um, to think about social justice and um, fairness outcomes. And I have to tell you that I've been really encouraged the last two years in particular that the group of students I have taught in a school that I would think is a little bit more conservative than um, many other law schools, but still it is now full of students who really think the criminal justice system needs a substantial mm-hmm. overhaul. And I am hopeful, though perhaps not optimistic, but at least hopeful that this may be a great time to continue a real reset. And as Alan had said earlier, to really think about uh, why we are even imprisoning the large number of people that we do. So I have a a textbook on um, sentencing law and policy, 
and I also ed- co-edit uh, the Federal Sentencing Reporter, which is a little bit misnamed. It really focuses on sentencing um, nationally in the states as well as um, federally, um, looking at developments. So we actually just did an issue on state prosecutors um, focusing on their power and um, also documenting some of the early policies of district attorneys around the country and what they did, especially with respect to um, entrance into jail and our early releases from jails. They don't have the power to do prison releases, but they can do a lot with respect to jails and we see really different policies emerging around the country. Oh, wow. Wow, that's interesting. So listen to just a clip of this article, and it's entitled, For Prisoners Released Due to COVID-19, A Different World Awaits. Just just, just the key word, a different world awaits. And so the uh, writer for this is Caitlin Newburn, Newman of uh, U.S. News. And so it says, more than 700 prisoners like McLees had been released in Illinois on April the 10th due to concerns surrounding the virus, according to the data from the state's Department of Corrections. Yet Jennifer Sobel, executive director of the Illinois Prison Project, says some may be returning to a world that's functionally unhabitable right now. So, um, Alan, this question is to you. Why would the writer feel, um, well, why would you feel that the writer and Jennifer Sobel, which is the the executive director of the Illinois prison project would feel that the world is dysfunctional or or do you think it's because of no employment or they just was released and they don't have nothing to turn back to or their communities or in poverty what is your take on that on that article my my take on the article is um unfortunately we become this prison state that we're in is almost almost like a plantation society in some way, you know, the prison industry, you know, and now uh, for some of your listeners who may not be aware, uh, the lobbyists in Washington, you know, and the powerful people who are influencing politicians have, have made a movement towards making private prisons, which are money-making machines for major corporations to mm-hmm. house these prisoners. <clears throat> and um, basically it's a giant industry in our society and if you think about it the criminal justice system itself is a huge industry uh um it's a a giant industry you talk about all the police officers all the court staff the judges the uh, the whole system and it's amazing um just it's a very interesting phenomenon you know if you look at they show these maps i don't know if you've seen them these maps lately where they show how with the covid the environment on the earth is much more clear. You know, the, the pollution has gone away. And it's mm-hmm. interesting, in the state of Connecticut, you know, sometimes um, good things come out of a crisis. Um, and here in the state of Connecticut, we've shut down the criminal justice system completely. And, and somebody, if you went back a year or two ago and said, hey, you know <clears> what, <throat> we're going to shut down the criminal justice system, we're going to stop arresting people, we're not going to put people in jail. We're not going to have bond. We're going to release everyone and give them a promise to appear. And that's basically what's going on. But I said, well, we're going to have anarchy. We're going to have crime. People are going to be going crazy, right? Mm-hmm. But there's there's no problems here in Connecticut right now. We haven't had a, a court system open in, in uh, five weeks. Uh, for five weeks, the police have basically arrested almost nobody. Everyone's been behaving very well. So to answer your question, I think that these thoughts and sentiments which you've just shared with your listeners are the negative, foolish, uh, uh, defeatist uh, thoughts that are going to perpetrate the uh, plantation-like mentality of the prison uh, justice system. Oh, well, these people are so lost, they have no place to go. That's a very negative thought. That's totally negative. Everybody Mm -hmm. has a place to go. Everybody has an opportunity, and I don't believe that. And you know what? If they do need help and a place to go, like they pointed out in my previous comments today, 
with the cost, the tremendous cost. Now, I haven't analyzed every state. It sounds like some of your other listeners may have better information uh, about uh, the, the law school professor. has um, <laughs> better information about other states' cost of housing inmates, but housing inmates is a very expensive business. Here in Connecticut, it's $52,000 a year. If we... In New York City, for instance, when they're releasing the inmates, they're giving them the uh, uh, ability to stay in a hotel, give them a small gift card uh, on an ATM and a phone. Mm-hmm. Uh, spending $62,000 housing them in a jail, why not give them a few basic resources? It's a lot less expensive. Help them up. Help lift them up and give them a mm-hmm. good start. Give them an opportunity. It, it's a lot It's a lot better um I think we need to start being positive um, about uh, helping people get out of prison, helping to clear their record so they don't have a criminal record that keeps them from getting employment, and helping to present opportunities um, to advance uh, their lives. Because at the end of the day, most of the people who are in prison want to get out and get a job and be a normal person. It's unfortunate that society throws up a lot of obstacles and roadblocks with these type of negative thoughts that you just said um, mm-hmm. and, and stereotypes and prejudice that that stand in their way to living a normal life. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, Kay, uh, this question is for you. According to an article that was released today, and it was released uh, by um, a reporter, uh, Laura Strickler of NBC News, and the headlines and topics of this article um, uh, includes nursing home industry pushes for immunity from lawsuits during coronavirus um, emergency. So is that so? Can they do that? Can they uh, retrieve themselves from a lawsuit or going to court? What ramifications does the family have in order to protect their loved one's rights? Oh, boy, Diane. Well, now you're really going to get me wound up this morning <laughs> because uh, <laughs> that's well, let's see. We can't we can't use curse words on this show, right? Uh, it's a <laughs> PG audience. Um, well, that's just it's just wrong, 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 wrong on so many levels. First of all, mm-hmm. we're talking about the most vulnerable members of our community, and the people that we should be lifting up and honoring in our society, not throwing them in the waste bin when they get too old or too sick or too inconvenient for us. Um, Mm -hmm. I I could almost argue that the nursing home industry already has almost complete immunity. And let me explain to you why I say that. Mm -hmm. There are some things that are in common with nursing homes and particularly those nursing homes that are part of a corporate chain. Over the past many years, there have been efforts to consolidate. So instead of having your local mom and pop nursing home that's been in the family for generations and they entered that business because they truly, truly care about senior citizens and providing good care, these Mm -hmm. are large corporations. Um, and ultimately, you may not even know who owns the nursing home. It could be some uh, hedge fund. But the nursing home industry in general, they set their businesses up to shield themselves from liability for injuring their residents. So oh, wow. each nursing home, by yes, it's intentional and it's a real problem. So let's say, for example, that a corporate owner owns uh, three nursing homes in a particular city. Well, the corporation may be worth, you know, tens of millions of dollars, but Mm -hmm. they structure each nursing home such that it has no assets. So one company might own the building, another company might own the land, Another company might own the equipment. Another company might employ the staff. And 
it's a maze and very difficult to find who has the money. In, in one particular case that I had, we finally traced the assets back to an aviation company uh, mm -hmm. that actually had such and such aviation company was the one that was really the owner of the nursing homes. The other thing that is a very common tactic with nursing homes is they carry very little insurance. And the most common type of insurance policy they buy is called a cannibalizing policy or a wasting policy. In Texas, for example, 99% of the time, a nursing home will have a $100,000 cannibalizing policy. So let's say they, a nursing home in Dallas horribly abused a resident. They hire me. I send a notice of claim to the nursing home. I get a response from an insurance company, and they say, well, uh, you know, we had to open the file. We had to do a little bit of investigation. So the $100,000 of coverage that there was is now worth $93,000 because mm -hmm. the insurance diminishes by attorney's fees and expenses to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So the other tactic is, you know, number one, come after us. We don't own anything and good luck trying to trace, you know, the assets. But number two, knock yourself out, Kay Van Way. Spend the next three years of your life, you know, beating up on us. But more, the more you do, the less money there's going to be for your client. By the time you get this case to trial, that hundred will go to zero. Wow. Um, and it's not just Texas. Other states have these cannibalizing policies as well. And, of course, and I'll be quiet. I told you you were getting me wound up. But no, go ahead. Go ahead, okay. <laughs> the other problem is that tort reform was disproportionately harsh on the elderly to begin with. So in Texas, by way of example, a nursing home resident who was uh, horribly neglected or horribly abused the maximum they could ever recover is two hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and it it disproportionately uh, discriminates against them because there are exceptions to the caps on damages in medical malpractice cases for people who are wage earners. So if somebody filed a medical malpractice case and they were a wage earner and supported three children and a spouse, then you could recover those losses if they were no longer able to work or they were killed and the family relied upon them uh, economically. But with mm -hmm. children and elderly people or disabled people, <clears throat> it is a hard, hard, hard economic cap. So the fact that they are now trying to push for immunity is just laughable, number one, and number two, very dangerous, very, very dangerous. The conditions in many, not all, many mm -hmm. nursing homes is <clears throat> abysmal, just awful. Oh, wow, wow. That yeah. is certainly um, sad to hear after, um, you know, knowing that the families are at, not at fault, uh, but, you know, you have some states, um, their legal policies, they're not at fault as, as well as like at will, um, if you so to speak. And so that's kind of um, it's kind of um, disturbing to hear um, as well as I was reading that article that, um, you know, nursing homes are able to kind of pull out if they want to, uh, you know, from tort claims, because I'm pretty sure uh, that the families do not care they're still going to perhaps maybe try to file um, suit anyway to see if they can be able to recompense um, anything out of, you know, their families being um, <clears throat> inconvenienced or even, you know, perished from the COVID-19. So, Nora, <clears throat> even with that, um, how do you think that the, the, the law system will rewrite the law in the federal um, guidelines? How do you feel uh, or what do you think that can incur – um, as to how we as a nation rewrite this. Because, see, this is something we have never dealt with before. We've had the N1, uh, H1N1, we've, we've had the Ebola, we've had the swine flu and what have you, and they, now they're trying to, um, you know, uh, put lawsuits 
forgot about that K, so be thinking about that, of how they're trying to, some states are filing lawsuits against um, China, <laughs> saying that they're the causing of yeah. all of these people dying in the U.S. So, Nora, um, share with us uh, your, your concept of that, of how you think that the policies and procedures will be written for offenders as to if if something drastic like that, this is drastic. This is not something that is, you know, like a slap on the hand. This is a drastic um, pandemic. How do you do you feel that uh, laws should be rewritten uh, for offenders and their families if something like this occurs again? I think laws should be rewritten for any point in time, not just a pandemic. Um, okay. We have, um, as Alan said when we started, the largest prison system in the world. We also mm-hmm. have hundreds of thousands of people every day going through our jail system, which is truly a revolving door. And part of the problem, I think, is just how we think about people. The minute you label someone inmate or prisoner, people start having all these kind of thoughts Um, And Mm -hmm. I think ultimately they all combine to thinking these are almost like aliens. They're nothing like me. And the minute you call them people in prison, I think there's a different realization. Oh, my God, they may have families, which so many of them do. It's a small Mm -hmm. group, for example, that has no housing at all. And we need to be able to help them. And right now, certainly hotels are the easiest place um, to put them because there um, is room there. Um, But we need to rethink how we think about um, people and how we think about violations. So I think the easiest thing, and there's been starting, um, I am certainly in some jurisdictions, including uh, my own here in Virginia, that we think about holding people pretrial. These are people who are accused of something, but they aren't convicted. And generally we have said, pay me a lot of money and then I'll let you out, which clearly skews Mm -hmm. to help those who are able to put up the money and the poor people end up sitting in jail, which makes them more likely to plead to the offense uh, that they are Mm -hmm. charged with just so that they can get it behind them. That is totally wrong. Those are people other than a small group that would be a danger to others while they are out, most of these we can release. Most of the people now who have short-term sentences, we could send home on home confinement. I think one of the great things out of all of this, and I say this with a little bit of a chuckle, is that we all learn that home confinement is a real sentence. None of us like to be at home all day, we have realized. We like to be in charge of our own schedule. We like to go to the coffee house and to the grocery store and to the gym. And you can't do that when you're in home confinement um, other than going to work. So I think that is a total um, kind of easy opportunity to really move um, on those people. I think the other flip side, um, I love case comparisons um, to nursing homes. And in part that is because we're basically running a large nursing home in so many of our prisons. Um, Our Mm -hmm. inmates are getting so old because of these exponential sentences we put on them. I have myself been to a prison in Colorado where the men were in wheelchairs. They could barely walk. They were on walkers. Um, They couldn't, uh, like, do anything for themselves anymore. That's what I think is a nursing home, not a prison. Why, why do we keep these people incarcerated for that long? So I think we really need to think about the length of time that we keep people. We know recidivism drops dramatically, the likelihood of reoffending, mm-hmm. once you're in your late 20s. But we don't seem to kind of put this into our mindset at all. So I think all of those would be relatively easy things now to rethink as we're seeing how terrible the conditions um, in these prisons are. The other thing we really need to do is help people once they get out. And this is crucial right now with the unemployment rate, the way it will be. The the last people who will get jobs will be the ones with a prior criminal record. So helping people clear their record, um, really um, motivating employers, maybe with a financial incentive, to give an opportunity to people who have a criminal record. Um, All of that will be really important going forward. Uh, We can do this as a country, uh, but we really need to be willing um, to kind of put the emphasis behind all of our people. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So back to you, uh, Kay, real quick. Um, and so we're going to uh, briefly touch on the fact of the uh, the lawsuits that are coming out now against um, China. And so according to ABC is an article that was written by the Associated Press. It states that China calls virus lawsuit brought by U.S. state very absurd. So how far do you feel that the states here in the U.S. will get far with trying to you know, uh, filed uh, tort claims against China, although that's where it originated from. But do they have any legal grounds here in the U.S. to be able to do that? Well, <clears throat> kudos to the smart lawyers who figured out how to do that. I mean, suing suing China is kind of above my pay grade. Um, but <clears throat> all kidding aside, what I – think of when I think of that is I boil it down to its most basic components. And if it was a quote unquote ordinary lawsuit, uh, not one involving states and foreign nations, the law provides for comparative negligence um, Mm -hmm. and contributory negligence, meaning the law allows for looking at all of those that may be at fault. So in many, many types of lawsuits, the parties will plead to say, well, it wasn't my fault, but if somebody thinks that it was my fault, and I'm also going to point the finger back at you, you the person that's blaming me, or Mm -hmm. somebody Mm -hmm. else. Um, And so what I think is that there will be Uh, other blame that will be brought to light and that China would defend itself by saying that perhaps the United States' response was not um, fast enough or appropriate enough, and they may cite to the statistics to show how uh, other countries were able to respond and keep, keep the consequences down as well as it could trickle down to our private hospital industry uh, by Mm -hmm. saying, well, perhaps our hospitals weren't as prepared as they could be. Mm -hmm. And I'm all Mm -hmm. for having billions of dollars from China flow back into our our economy that has just been devastated. But I think think ultimately that it's our responsibility to protect ourselves from – viruses and pandemics. Mhm. Mhm. Absolutely. Um I think it is is it's I don't know. I'm not for sure I'm not a legal attorney or anything like that. I'm just a a publisher podcast host. <laughs> so I I'm, I'm thinking that 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 is it's going to a lot of lawsuits it, you all are going to be busy. I'm going to say that probably for the next 5, 6, 10 years simply because of the fact um of course the courts are going to be overflowed. And the cases are going to continue to grow. You know, people are not looking at the fact that, oh, well, uh, they're not going to pay me any attention. People are going to try to take their best shot. They don't care, you know, whether uh, they win or lose. They just want their voices to be heard. So with that being said, Diane, um, Diane, Alan, Diane, 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 huh? Diane, 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 if I could just jump in one second on this uh, China lawsuit thing, you know, um, it, it, it's great to point blame at people and everyone's mad with China. And, you know, I think they they definitely have a lot of uh, responsibility for underreporting and not disclosing the situation. But Mm -hmm. I just want to point out that um, I did some research on this. Um, I I wasn't really expecting to come to to raise this question, but I did some research on this uh, about a week ago for an independent uh, issue uh, in my practice. And um, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people are filing these lawsuits um, but I don't think they're going to go anywhere because there's something called sovereign immunity. And um, mm-hmm. as a nation, um, you know, the the questionable negligent actions of another nation, you know, <clears throat> second guessing mm-hmm. their, their, their actions, even although we may not agree with them, are, are, are clearly, you know, not something that's addressable in our civil courts. Okay. Uh, and, that, okay. and that's pretty clear. I mean, people are filing these lawsuits because they're outraged. Out, out, they're totally outraged by what China did. And and I think that when sovereign actors, state nations, which is really beyond the scope of my practice, but when state na- actors 
do outrageous things, it's it's more of a political situation, right? That's something okay. for President Trump to take action against China and punish them. Uh, it, it seems that when governors mm-hmm. governors make mistakes, but I think that'll play out in a court system. Obviously, okay. China's okay. going to hire its lawyers, and 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 they're going to have a lot of lawsuits pending. But mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, yeah. it's a terrible situation. Mm-hmm. I also well, can I add one more thing, ahead. Diane? I don't want to run Go run ahead, over okay. on the time, but the access to the court system is not for everyone, and okay. so people who litigants who have unlimited funds can litigate all day long. Um, people who don't have the funds have got to find lawyers who are willing to take those cases on a contingent fee basis, and mm-hmm. those are lawyers <laughs> like me. I have. Not one single client, and really never have over many years, that has paid me for my time. I always, and many lawyers like me, take cases. Um, we spend sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars and years of our time hoping that we're successful. So I just wanted to point out when we talk about that there's going to be years and years and years of litigation. Um, it, it will be interesting because I think that there's people that are going to have the money to have those fights are going to have those fights. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I so that's absolutely, all I wanted um, to add there. Okay, that's fine. That's fine because most of your, which is going to be the next question for um, Alan, and and so that's in regard to the protests, and so that's the reason why um, I guess I made that statement simply because of the fact most of your uh, states that are protesting now are mostly white collared uh, workers, and so they may can be able to afford, if you will, some of uh, the the the, um, the attorney fees that are affiliated with uh, the loved ones in the. Pre- prison system because I certainly would be one of them that would file if I if if the the prison system is responsible for protecting my loved one and then they come in um take for instance like I'm going to share a, a quick scenario with you in our local area here in Tennessee um the 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 um the rate grew but no one cited no one went to the media and said okay you're you you have prisoners out here at this West Tennessee detention facility that has uh covid-19 and it came had to come in through a staff i would think because uh by that time the president had suspended uh well most of your prisons had suspended visitation so now it has jumped to 28 plus the staff and so the people are, are outrageous outraged i'm sorry in this location because it stayed uh, Muffle so long until the U.S. Marshal Service had to go out and actually make a statement in the public that, yeah, we do have inmates that are, uh, uh, you know, tested positive for COVID. And so that's the reason why I'm saying that there are some people there, they don't care whether they have it or not. They're still going to go out there and they're going to press the issue um, in regards to um, uh, what uh, the resources that they have, such as the media, and the next one what we're going to talk about, um, Alan, is the protests. So when it comes to um, working with prosecutors and public defenders to to to, to I guess um, you know trying to get the attention of that. What do you see in the prison system as to the protest? They're protesting for for education because you know we got issues with that due to the COVID. There are, there are lawsuits that are going up to the roof uh, with uh, with the, with um, Drexel University, Liberty University. Okay, and then we have prison. We, you have your nursing homes. Now we have prisons. Their family members are also um, um, are upset, but they do not have the resources of how to protest. Why? Because of different income, different brackets, different demographics. So your white-collar workers may have the expenses or fees to be able to do that on the education level as well as the nursing home and hospital level. But what about the prisoners? What about their families that may cannot afford or do not know how to go out and protest? Well, it's an interesting point that you um – um, you bring, you raise. Um, I, you know, I just um, in, 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 in thinking about what you just pointed out. Um, you know, I'm not trying to take any political sides here, but recently we saw there were protesters in several states protesting um, to reopen the economy, 
and uh, protesting against stay-at-home orders. And mm-hmm. um, they they were very effectively organized. They went out in mass. Um, they a lot of them were carrying weapons and and, and, and storming the capitals. And it, it, when you when you drill down on it, it seems that there were certain you know. Um, right-wing conservative organizations that are very well funded that got behind these protests with you know massive social media campaigns and spending a lot of money to fund the organization of these protests that's what got the boots on the ground right money Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. when you when you see these protests um it's it's an organized effort with a lot of money behind it, you know, and then, you know, some, somehow in our society, when you see people with the American flag standing in front of a governor's uh, mansion or state Capitol mm-hmm. with guns protesting a stay at home order, that's mm-hmm. patriotic. But when, as we saw with Colin Kaepernick, the quarterback who took a knee to protest uh, uh, black lives matter, um, that's unpatriotic. So uh, I think there's some uh, uh, bias in, 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 in discriminating about speech itself in our society. You know, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and that shouldn't be the case because, of course, in, under the First Amendment, all speech has equal validity and protection. So how, how do these people, how should they protest? Well, it's, as you mentioned, it's tough because the constituents in prison are not well organized. You know, we have a lot of different uh, groups in, in prison. We have our Latino uh, brothers and sisters. We have our Afro-American brothers and sisters, Native, Native American, uh, elderly. There's a whole different bunch. It's very hard for them to organize. Um, I do have some suggestions uh, uh, for your listeners um, mm-hmm. on different groups. Um, there's the Bail Project. Um it's it's a very powerful group. Um, they they should they should connect with those people. Um, if 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 you Google um, if your listeners Google bail posting foundation or cash bail uh, posting, um, that's a great step that your listeners can take because there's a lot of organizations out there who are committed to helping post bail for inmates. And I just wanted to distinguish really quickly, you know, mm-hmm. in our criminal justice system. There's a huge distinguishing factor between people who are accused of a crime, who are not convicted, or being held on a cash bond that they can't make, in some cases as low as $200, who are stuck in a prison that they can't get out because of a small amount of money, and those who are convicted of a crime serving a sentence. And so the, the situation between those two are totally different. And just really quickly... If, if your loved one, if you're listening to the show and your loved one is being held on a bond, what you need to do is you need to contact your public defender or your lawyer and the state's attorney to try to lobby to get the bond lowered. And a lot of jurisdictions are doing that now. And it's kind of like the old saying, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mm-hmm. So, unfortunately, that's what's happening here. A lot of people are getting relief. <clears throat> and are getting uh, some type of um, outcome because they're 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 getting attention, right? And people who aren't speaking out aren't getting attention. So that's the first part of the system, first part of the situation. The other part of the system is people who are serving a sentence, who have already been sentenced, and then they have to make some type of a. A compassionate relief request or some type of a sentencing modification to get out of jail. That's more complicated. That involves, you know, participation of a judge, the, the prosecuting authority, and the, um, uh, the defense attorney working together in unison to try to make a, 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 a plea to the judge to modify the sentence. That's more complicated. So, so I don't know how. Um, uh, people can can really organize. I would suggest that people who are interested in the subject should should get on social media, perhaps start Facebook groups. Um, a time is fleeting. This is something that needs urgency. I I think social media is the best way to organize in these times. Obviously, you know, as you mentioned in the White House press briefings, 
and in um, all the things that we're seeing with governance, press briefings, prisoners' rights is not a is not a uh, issue of great importance. So the families and loved ones of the prisoners who are locked in jail or have no voice have to be the voice for the prisoners to bring the attention to the general public action because literally the prisons right now are, are killing ground. People mm-hmm. are dying. So unless, mm-hmm. unless society uh, takes action um, to help these people, um, not only the people in the, um, in the prisons, but in the nursing homes, uh, ironically uh, to my fellow um, panelists today, you know, it was ironic. I don't know if they were aware over here. In, I'm right next to New York state in New York state. They actually had a law. The, the governor of New York was forcing nursing homes to accept COVID positive uh, uh, elderly patients into the nursing home. Um, mm. Oh, wow. I, 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 I can't imagine, you know, if you worked in this country your whole life and you have your retirement and you're living in a nursing home and you just want to have peace and, and live out your final days. And these people are, bringing COVID positive people into your nursing home and infecting you and you're, you're spending your last days with a terrible illness and pain. Um, it's, it's to me, um, that's gotta be the, the, the greatest tragedy and it makes mm-hmm. me so sad. Mm-hmm. 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 <clears throat> Go ahead. Go ahead. Kay. I, know, I think that's you. Oh no, I'm sorry. I didn't know I was being so audible, but you know, that was very, very well put, Alan. You're you're absolutely right. I, I tell my kids all the time just to I just hope and pray that I'm, you know, climbing some scaling mu- some mountaintop and I get to the top of Kilimanjaro or something and keel over mm-hmm. because, you know, God bless any of us that have to go into one of these nursing home facilities or have to face the decision that we just physically cannot take care of a loved one and have to put them there. Mhm, mhm, absolutely. So, uh, Nora, this question is for you, and this is in regards to um, the state of Mississippi. So, it's no secret. Um, I think even since I was um, a child or younger, back in the seventies and the late sixties, uh, Mississippi has always been uh, reflected on upon as the poorest state. So, with that being said, um, with uh, during the COVID issue that is going on, it seems like the governor is announcing very little that is to be done with the uh, with the offenders in that state. You know, we've had a crisis about a lot of them had passed away due to riots. And then with the federal uh, 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 sentencing guidelines, it's totally deplorable as to, I think, one of the, 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 the prisoners in Parchman, which I think that's the worst prison, I think, they were saying that Mississippi has um, I think the guy is like 80-something years old, and, and they just denied his um, parole. And it was and this was from a segment on Dateline. Uh, I think they did a documentary, um, okay, Lester Holt, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that's on the NBC Nightly News, had went there and stayed for about two days. So what is it that the community, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to just be honest with you, it was some churches that had to go to the state of Mississippi and register some individuals back in the early 2000s because they did not have a social security card. They did not even know what it was. And so what can individuals do? I know we can't do a whole lot because we live in various states, but what can they do to be able to educate themselves as to how to um, advocate for their loved one? And um, I think they have had a prisoner that has passed away due to the COVID-19 um, in the state of Mississippi. And I'm not for sure if the governor has reopened that state. Uh, he ne- he don't need to because it's um, it's some issues that are going there, I mean, that are going on there. So what is it that they can be able to do um, in regards to <sighs> – to the federal, it is really something how their guidelines will incarcerate a person at the age of 20, and this man is almost or is 80 years old. So in regards mm-hmm. to that, what, how can the families go in and make their voices to be heard? Um, thank you, Diane. You're raising a great um, question. And let me just step back for a second and talk a little bit about state um, and federal because I okay. think that confuses people um, really substantially. So we have the state systems, 
most of our crimes are actually um, state crimes, um, murders, uh, larceny, burglary, um, virtually all the time are state crimes. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. in the prisons, you're absolutely right. The governors are the ones that can really release people the fastest. They can do mm -hmm. it through a sentence commutation or in Virginia, for example, the governor has really pushed the parole board to do early parole um, releases. But they can only do that in Virginia for people who were sentenced before 1995. Then Virginia abolished parole, which happened in many mm -hmm. um, states. So that's your state uh, prison. So um, I'm not sure whether the person in Mississippi was denied parole by the state board, but a lot of time they feel that um, they shouldn't be granting parole because the crime was terrible. Well, if the crime was terrible, it's still 40, 50, 60 years ago. At some mm -hmm. point, we need to let go as a society um, and move on and forgive. Or they're afraid that somebody may go out and commit another crime. Well, not very likely when you're 80 or 70 or 60 or 50 or even 40. Um, mm -hmm. All the data tells us that. Now, there's, of course, a few exceptions, but they're really rare, those types of people. Now, the federal system, it's the president um, who could do a lot right now. And our president, unfortunately, is doing absolutely nothing. So Ron Blagojevich, who you mentioned earlier, the um, very corrupt governor from Illinois, he received a presidential <laughs> commutation um, for no reason other than the president thought it was unjust that he had been um, convicted. Um, most of the president's um, commutations and pardons have been for politically connected people. Um, right now, we could use commutations uh, to release people who are um, been who are over 55, who are no threat to community, um, who have served a substantial portion of their sentence. I mean, they're whole groups we should could release easily without any kind of um, danger. So I think that um, lobbying the president, um, I think we need to get Kim Kardashian out there um, again and talk about mm -hmm. that all the time. And I'm unfortunately not kidding about this. We used to have a process mm -hmm. Uh, for these releases, uh, but right now we need to act uh, quickly, and I think there are people who can make the president um, do that. At the same time, what can people do? I agree with Alan. Um, social media, talk about your loved ones. Talk about what's going on in the prison. Um, contact the ACLU National Prison Project. They've done litigation around the country and actually won cases to get courts to say, this could be a violation of the Eighth Amendment, Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause. You must move to release um, people. Um, and then one long-term project your next district attorney election. It is really, really important what the philosophy of your district attorney is. Do they allow for no cash bond releases? Um, will they uh, let people go out on um, electronic monitoring and home confinement? And by the way, that electronic monitoring has to be free so we don't saddle people with um, long-term long debt. So there's a lot that people can really do but with an election coming up in November and many district attorneys being up for re-election, that is a really important one for people to keep in mind. Oh, wow. That's awesome. So with that being said, Alan, we're going to get you to touch on that as to how important uh, for the viewers and oh, not the viewers, the listeners, I'm sorry, to be able to make sure that who they're voting for. You know, if they're if their district attorney is not providing the, the resources and tools, like take, for instance, in our locale, uh, the nearest jurisdictions in, in Memphis, he fights for, well, she does. She fights for the citizens of that area of Shelby County. So how important, I mean, because a lot of times the people just don't know. They don't even know, oh, it's, it's, it's the President of the United States. No, it got to trickle down from the small level all the way up to the top. So share with the audience as to how important that is for them to get the knowledge and tools that they need as to who is representing them on the law enforcement end. You know, um, the, the, the problem with the United States and our, our prison um, uh, issue is, is, I think stems from this problem is the typical voter in the United States uh, sees crime uh, as, as an issue of them um, as sees crime oh, wow. as, a, as an alien an alien, uh, not me. 
it's them. Okay, mm-hmm. so it sees uh, it, that's how the typical individual looks at it, the crime problem. It's it's not their problem. It's a problem that's threatening them, right? So it needs to be controlled, right? So that that's how this mm-hmm. whole thing comes apart, because people don't appreciate the fact that police make mistakes, right? I'm not mm-hmm, trying to mm-hmm. say that all policemen are bad. There are bad policemen who are liars. We see that all the time. The Innocence mm-hmm. Projects are uh, exonerating people who have been wrongfully uh, convicted of crimes through police misconduct all the time. It happens. There's a lot of police officers, so there's a few bad apples, right? But sometimes police officers make mistakes and don't carefully mm-hmm. investigate cases, right? So it is perfectly possible that all the panelists here today may find themselves wrongfully accused of a crime, right? Wrongfully convicted of a crime that they didn't commit. The prisons are filled with people who, who are innocent and who are doing time for something they didn't do for a whole host of reasons, which we can't get into today. We don't have enough time to talk about all those problems. But what I'm trying to say is the reason why we have a problem is, is because the, the typical average voter doesn't understand that they're at risk, that there's a possibility they may find themselves on the wrong end, the receiving end of a unfair prosecution. Therefore, mm-hmm. they look at these individuals who are being prosecuted as the enemy, and they don't care what happens to these people. That's my perception of it. So, so mm-hmm. the people who are being oppressed need to, to come together to, to empower themselves to have their voice heard. And, and I think we're making some progress on this. I think, I think the political winds are shifting. I think a lot of um, movement is being made on these issues lately, and I'm happy for that. And, and as I pointed out in my earlier comments today, one of the issues we have is that the, the oppressed groups, you know, it, it, uh, sadly, in the United States, um, as I pointed out, the COVID crisis is disproportionately affecting minority groups due to the um, not because they're they're um, genetically predisposed to COVID. It's because of the fact that they lack the financial resources to get appropriate health care and because they live um, their work um, conditions and their living conditions are um, putting them in an unhealthy living situation. It's, it's, a, it's a totally, it's an economic situation. So similarly, you know, these same groups uh, lack cohesive um, um, uh, force and power. They, they don't mm-hmm. have power and political power, political capital. Also, mm-hmm. a lot of times these same folks, um, a lot of them, they work two or three jobs. So it's very difficult for them to find time to lobby um, legislators and get activated and find time to, to move. You know, I can't, I can't think of a mom who's trying to raise her kids and, and working two or three jobs who's going to buy a ticket to go to a fundraiser for some um, prosecutor um, uh, for his reelection, right? And talk to mm-hmm. him about, uh, you know, spend five hundred dollars for a dinner, and talk to him about her thoughts on um, criminal justice reform, and say, you know, what's your position on um, cash bond? Um, you know, the, the types of folks who are showing up for those events and funding these political campaigns are the are the individuals who, who for the most part, have a position that's uh, um, not aligned with the kinds of things I'm I'm suggesting. So. As I suggested earlier, I think the strongest, you know, platform that people have is, is social media. Social media is, is changing a lot of things. It's empowering a lot of people, and um, it can join a lot of people together. And one of the biggest problems that we face in this society for decades has been that the oppressed uh, groups in our society are very uh, scattered all different constituents together, they actually are, are not a minority. They're the majority at this point um, as a whole. The problem is, is because there's so many different constituents within those groups 
that lack organization as a group, as a, as a whole, they don't have a powerful voice for prison reform Mm -hmm. and for Mm -hmm. uh, sentencing reform. Um, Hopefully I would just say this final comment on this thought is I hope that the farce of our criminal justice system, the insanity of being the world's largest um, prison state and the fact of the danger that this presents for not only this, uh, you know, for, I would say this, fortunately, the COVID has turned out to be as, as, you know, and regrettably, many people are dying. It's a horrible situation. It's, a, it's an economic disaster. But compared to other potential pathogens that are out there that could come in the future, this, is, this one seems to be relatively benign. A lot of people have milder symptoms, right? Imagine if a more serious pandemic like the one in 1918 came along with the type of prison system we have, the, the massive um, death that would occur. So, so it, you know, it's time to, to wake up and realize that, that having a prison state that we, like we have is a huge liability and it's time to take some action. Hopefully this you know, experience will cause people to think about um, the prison state, the tremendous cost of running the prison state, and perhaps spending those resources in another direction. Imagine if we had been spending all these billions of dollars we spend every year incarcerating people for no reason that obviously could be staying in house arrest with an ankle bracelet and using that money to research against flus and pandemics and other illnesses mm. that are that are serious health threats, and we put the money to for scientists and and other um, areas, we could have pr- possibly prevented this problem. But instead, mm-hmm. we're spending all this money on prisons. Mm-hmm. 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 Absolutely, I most absolutely agree with that. Um, and with that being said, we're just about getting ready to go out of air time, so we would like to go around the panel. And for each one uh, to be able to share um, how to be able to, for the listeners and the audience to be able to follow them and to be able to get in contact with them or how they can be able to reach them. So we're going to start with you first, Kay, and you share with the audience of how they can reach you. Well, thanks again, Diane. It was a great conversation. It's Kay Van Way. You can email me directly. It's K K A Y at vwpwlaw.com. Okay. And Nora? Um, I share, um, Keith, thank you for inviting me and for this uh, really interesting conversation. Um, Mm -hmm. You can follow me on Twitter, um, and let me um, spell this for you. Uh, It's N for Nora, and then my entire last name. So it's N, E is David, M is in Mary, L, I, T is Tom, and Nancy, E, Aris and Robert. Or you can also email me directly, and there is just the reverse, my last name and my first initial, at wlu.edu. And the great thing about my last name, once you can spell it, it's really easy to find me anywhere uh, by just putting it in Google. Thank you. Okay, okay, Alan, go ahead. Diane, it was a pleasure once again to share with you, and I hope that the listeners are, are empowered and motivated to take action and, and, and uh, seek justice for their loved ones. Uh, if anyone wishes to contact me, I can be reached on my website at uh, www.allen, A L L A N F. Friedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, law.com, or somebody can call me anytime, 24 hours a day, at 203-357-5555. Thank you so much, Diane. And thank you for the panel guests for being our um, our feature experts today. Um, actually, the audience got a three and one, and that is in regards to the prison offenders' release and also on the educational Um, not the educational, but the nursing home uh, side of it, of the COVID pandemic, as well as the federal sentencing and guidelines. And we would like to thank everyone for participating um, and taking the opportunity to be with us today, as well as our listeners. And, of course, you can go to our website for our Women Who Rock With Success at www.womenwhorockwithsuccess.com. So thanks again, everyone, for being um, on the show today. 
Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Thank you Diane. <clears throat> Stay safe. You too. Thank you. Take care, everybody. <laughs>